Thank you, Maya. Thank you very much, Maya. Um, and do I turn this one off? There, okay. Um, and uh, thank you, Maya, and also uh, Mikkel and Berk and Patrick um, for bringing all of us together. It's just been a remarkable um, day and a half so far, and um, there have been just some terrific conversations and, and wonderful introductions happening as people get to know each other in their work across some disciplinary boundaries. Um, this was Imogen Heap um, singing her song, Tiny Little Human, which I'm going to talk about um, near the end of the talk. But f let me get my little presentation up. Um, does that look right? Okay. As, as Maya said, I've been doing um, some work recently on um, new technologies of money and payment. And um, in the talk today, what I thought I would do was um, bring some very new research that I've been working on just in the past few months on um, the Bitcoin phenomenon. And some of you have heard of Bitcoin, this cryptocurrency. Um, I actually um, have become very interested in what's happening um, as it is shifting out of the realm of money and currency and into the realm of accounting and property. And um, that's what I'm going to try to convey some of um, today. And I will give you a little bit of a, a primer on, on Bitcoin so you understand the basic system and can, <coughs> can then understand how it's now being used to do things with property. And Imogen um, Heap becomes a key uh, player in that, in that discussion. But to begin, I want to uh, open up just by reviewing some very basic points in the anthropology and sociology of money um, via the work of Viviana Zelizer, because it was through this money conversation around Bitcoin that got me into it in the first place, and understanding some of the, the basics of how we think about money you know, outside of economics um, will help explain the, the system that I'll be trying to describe um, later on as we get into the talk. Now, You'll remember um, that Viviana Zelizer argues that money is socially differentiated and that that differentiation is affected through earmarking. This is one of her key points. And earmarking um, is really nothing more than a kind of accounting. And in her book, uh, The Social Meaning of Money, Zelizer begins by talking about these incredibly evocative stories of mid-20th mid century housewives um, who uh, exploited a system that um, she and other sociologists called tin can accounting. This is not a tin can, but a Coke bottle, um, but you get the idea. Uh, this is in, in, in the Philippines, where a housewife is storing uh, money, sequestering it, earmarking it for special purposes in a Coke bottle up in the roof rafters where she can't access it. Um, listen to, to one such housewife in the United States at mid-century. This is um, from some of the sociological literature that Zelizer drew upon in her, in her book. Here's a, a quote from the housewife. I have a silly little system. Whenever my husband gets paid, I take away so much money from my grocery money and put it in a kitchen drawer. Then I take all the rest and put it into a tin can. If we can pay a bill in person, we take cash out of the can. Now, whatever's left over in the tin by the, end of the, next, uh, by the time of the next payday, we transfer into the bank account to pay our future bills. Such stories led Zelizer to excavate how money, presum presumed to be purely fungible, gets parceled out into distinct bundles and set to specific uses that open a window into social worlds of meaning and relationality that, crucially, are created by this kind of informal accounting. Lacking other easy means of keeping track of their money and expenditures, the housewives that the sociologists were studying um, at mid-century found ways materially to segregate and visualize their financial standing and to make saving and purchasing decisions. Their accounts, physically manifested in tin cans, envelopes, or china pitchers, were also a material demonstration of their relationships and values. Other researchers later, building on Zelizer and citing similar studies, were able to prove experimentally how people deploy funds and other resources based on implicit and explicit labeling schemes. That research, however, generally aimed to show how such labeling led to misallocations, um, that it was all kind of irrational decision-making, um, instead of underscoring money social meanings. The primary sources on, on such forms of so-called mental accounting also documented that the practice often falls down because, among other things, um, as some of the researchers wrote, people have a tendency to cheat a little. 
I think the authors in the mental accounting literature uh, got something wrong that Zelizer got right. Tin can accounting was a form of physically differentiating monies, not so much mentally. It was a socio-material practice that embodied social meanings. The aim was not merely to control spending, but to give a visceral account, not a mental account. This is an account that you can feel the heft of in your hand, right? You not only see it and think about it, but you kind of feel it and have a, a visceral uh, response to it an account that women could literally weigh in their hands to help them assess their current status and their future, future spending. This um, quality of constraint, the need to deal with the tendency to cheat, the rendering of non-fungible, otherwise uh, liquid currency, all of these features that Zelizer was discussing with this tin can accounting and the social meanings of money prefigure in some important respects um, the Bitcoin system and its own social relations and meanings, as I'll talk about now. Now, I'm not sure what the next slide is. Okay, that's good. Uh, Bitcoin is the brainchild of an anonymous programmer or programmers who penned a white paper under the name Satoshi Nakamoto on the design of a digital currency um, that was released over the internet in 2008. The system that they created used a combination of two existing ideas to create uh, a digital means for exchanging value that shares many of the attributes of physical banknotes, chief among them anonymity, irrevocability, and the inability to double spend, which means that I can't duplicate my digital money by cutting and pasting and then have all of a sudden double the money I had before. Um, and that last quality is crucial in digital environments where duplication like that is very easy. Um, Satoshi, whoever he or they or she was, and other cryptocurrency advocates also desired a system that would not depend on any central point of control. This commitment to decentralization derives both from a skepticism or hostility to states and banks, as well as a transformation of the internet's distributed network structure, structure into a kind of ideology, right? Taking the, distribu the distributed nature of the internet and kind of making it um, ideological. And I said it, it derives on two, uh, it relies on two existing systems. Um, one is a, uh, a distributed database that contains a ledger of all transactions. That database is called the blockchain. I'll explain how it works in a second. The second is a, uh, a protocol for verifying transactions in that ledger by way of a computationally difficult competition among all the peers involved in the network. This is called um, a proof of work. The, um, the technical details are challenging, but the concept is pretty straightforward. Um, this is a distributed system, so it's not centralized or uh, you know, decentralized in the way that we think of the internet, where there are still key nodes that then connect everybody. Rather, it's a distributed system um, where it, this is, I'm now speaking out of, in theory, not how it's really unfolded, but in theory, every single node in the network um, participates to the same degree um, in the system. Um, and it's based on a ledger. And just think for a minute about what money is, right? Money, uh, Minsky and Keynes and that whole line of people who, according to Bill Maurer, are essentially correct on money, say that money is basically a, a two-sided uh, ledger sheet operation, right? Money is what is in the Wells Fargo ledger book back in the vault, back in the day. Um, recording uh, credits and debits. You don't need any kind of token or anything to have money go. You just need to have this kind of ledger of debits and credits. Um, what Bitcoin has basically done is instead of having these ledgers in, you know, think old time bank vaults where you literally had the books back in the bank, instead of having that, or instead of having something like you have today where there are centralized accounts um, stored electronically in bank servers, um, that are all connected to each other usually and have some connection to a central bank. Instead of that kind of central uh, control of the ledger, what you do is you use the infrastructure of the internet um, to replicate the ledger um, everywhere. So the ledger exists on every single node um, in the network. Um, oops. And what you do is anytime anyone makes a transaction, um, there, they basically send a signal to that network saying, I am making this transaction now. The network then goes to work um, in this computation game, basically, um, which is essentially a kind of, of, of computationally intensive lottery to verify 
the transaction. Um, when the transaction is verified, a block is said to be completed. This is why it's called a blockchain. Essentially, a page in the ledger um, has been updated, is, said to, is verified by participating nodes in the network, and then that update goes everywhere um, all at once. Okay, oops, I didn't want to do that yet. Um, so if I want to uh, send um, Bitcoin from my account to another person's account, the protocol distributes my request to the entire network, which in turn requires that I authorize the transaction with a kind of password. Um, importantly, if I lose my password, there's no way for me ever to reclaim my Bitcoin ever again. Um, it gets locked up in the blockchain in this ledger forever. It's, people would say it's burned. Um, so just think about this for a minute with reference to existing kind of ledger, uh, paper ledger-based technologies. There's no coin here. Um, there's no token. There's just accounting. In this kind of system, there's no central authority maintaining that accounting. Every whoops, I'm sort of stuck on something there. Everybody's um, doing it uh, all at once, all together. Um, the database containing this distributed ledger um, is, main, is, is, is sort of sustained through a kind of competition and consensus. Competition to be the first one to verify the transaction, and then consensus once it's distributed to the entire network and everyone confirms it. This is uh, the basic of the Bitcoin system. It's basically a digital money of account, almost exactly like the clay tablets of ancient Mesopotamia that so exercised John Maynard Keynes, if you'll recall, except instead of being recorded um, baked on bricks um, or being recorded like my Wells Fargo ledger on paper documents, it lives um, in a uh, distributed ledger. Now, that's Bitcoin. Let me kind of step into its sort of social context and corporate context now because this thing that began essentially uh, as an experiment in money very quickly evolved into an experiment in accounting and accounting for property. When I attended a, a payments industry conference in 2013, Bitcoin proponents surreptitiously affixed stickers and handmade signs to tables and displays uh, in the exhibit hall. People associated with Bitcoin, this is in 2013, were vocally espousing anti-government, anti-fiat fiat currency, anti-federal reserve views. At the next year's meeting of the exact same conference, however, the exhibit hall was graced with professional-looking corporate displays. I don't have a picture, unfortunately, um, but they were staffed with hired female models um, promoting new Bitcoin startups. Um, and one such startup in 2014 announced its sponsorship of the, uh, the American football um, bowl, the St. Petersburg Bowl, which was renamed the St. Petersburg Bitcoin Bowl. Football aside, Bitcoin had entered the world of big business. Bitcoin-related venture capital funding approached a billion in 2015, actually surpassed a billion in 2015. Um, in 2014, it was around 300 million. But it's the blockchain, it's that distributed database, not the currency that's holding appeal outside of Silicon Valley and in the halls of Wall Street and, as we'll see, in some of the creative industries. Um, and this is because of the blockchain's essential nature um, as a database, as a, a distributed ledger that exists everywhere. Um, <clears throat> so um, the blockchain is a very special kind of ledger. As I said, it exists everywhere in the network. There's no one central repository where it lives or one central records keeper. And just keep in mind those, those old ledger books in the back of the bank um, or in the vault. Um, or since we're thinking about property, think about the cadastral maps and um, the cadastral registry kept in a central land titling office. Now, imagine a flood or a fire. Um, there goes all your records, right? There goes your accounting. With the blockchain, this risk of loss is minuscule. Um, if, if non-existent, because every node in the network has a copy of the whole ledger all the time. And the system is designed so that nodes in the network are continuously updating and synchronizing the ledgers. Now go back to that bank ledger book. Imagine a bad actor, uh, someone who through malice, fraud, error, or stupidity makes an incorrect entry. 
there might be audits, there might be reconciliation of accounts, but the effort to locate the discrepancy may be costly and time consuming. A core feature of the blockchain as a distributed ledger is that it's public. Every node in the network um, can see it. In fact, anyone in the world can see it. You don't need to be participating in the system since it's also posted online in real time. Although it's public, the identities of the transacting parties are concealed by the protocols that govern their passwords and addresses. Um, the transact transacting parties don't need to know each other, they don't need to trust each other in order to do business um, because you've got this process of transaction verification through distributed consensus, um, which ultimately uh, militates against fraud, at least against fraud once a transaction has entered into um, the blockchain and been verified. And one interesting thing, you probably have heard a lot of the news stories about um, big frauds or scandals involving um, Bitcoin. What's interesting is almost all, well actually to date, to date all of those have happened outside the system, right? There's some, someone does something bad and then enters uh, a transaction into the blockchain um, where it gets verified and then is there. Um, all the, all the defrauding is happening outside and generally quite conventional, sort of Ponzi scheme type stuff or money laundering or uh, you know, purchasing illicit goods and then hiding the transaction um, in the blockchain. Um, fraud can also take place in a very, very mundane way where I can just steal your password um, and then make off with all your money. And um, many people who are involved in Bitcoin because of the threat of the theft of their password um, keep them, I think this is hilarious, keep them on little pieces of paper in their wallets, right? because um, they don't want anyone to hack into their system and get it and then steal all their Bitcoin. The other super easy fraud, um, and this is sort of you know, behind a lot of the, the more publicized, like Mt. Gox and stuff, um, cases are, I can just ask you, I can say, I'm a Bitcoin exchange, I'll sell you Bitcoin, give me your credit card number. <laughs> And then you give me your credit card number and I go have fun with that <laughs> and don't ever send you any Bitcoin. But again, that's not sort of a vulnerability of the system as such. It's all happening external to it. Now, um, because of all of these scandals, however, because of the highly publicized criminal cases that have involved Bitcoin, um, a lot of the people that I've talked to in the payments industry and who are trying to devise new, new uh, things to do with the blockchain say that the, the quote-unquote brand of Bitcoin is, is tainted, um, too tainted by these scandals and criminal investigations and prosecutions to gain any traction in um, mainstream um, places. And so people will say, before you go talk to your CEO about using the blockchain to do anything, do a search and replace and replace the word Bitcoin with blockchain everywhere in your, in your presentation or everywhere in your documents. This record-keeping quality of the Bitcoin system is attracting a great deal of interest um, among more established financial industry actors in the wholesale financial services industry and elsewhere. Um, essentially, people see this as a way to facilitate and especially speed up interbank clearance and settlement, as well as equities and derivative trading. Um, why this interest, and I'll, I'll give you an example of how they do this in a second, but why the interest in the blockchain? It's for these reasons um, up here. It's basically immutable. Once something is entered into it, no one can go back and change the old entries without everyone seeing that they've done so. And any change that you make once a transaction has been verified, anything that you, any change you make um, to prior transactions has to be agreed to by the consensus of the nodes in the network. And so it probably wouldn't work anyway, even if you tried. Um, and people talk about there being forks in the blockchain. Imagine again, the blockchain is a, a bunch of pages of a distributed ledger, and you might get a point where there's a disagreement in, 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 among the, the folks participating and you get a little fork and a side chain developing. That can only go so far, right? Um, unless everyone in the system says, yeah, yeah, that, that one is true, not the other one. And then they all, glom on, onto that one. Um, so what you get is a verifiable, time-stamped record of transactions. You get a persistent record of transactions because of its distributed nature, even if some of the nodes go dark, even if the power goes out, um, even if a bunch of people just kind of stop participating, as long as there's enough people participating to keep it going, the thing lasts. Um, and it's a kind of historical chronicle that can't be easily or unilaterally altered. 
Um, again, because the participating nodes are continuously synchronizing their copies of the database. Um, so at a conference sponsored by the American Banker Trade Magazine in July 2015, Blythe Masters, formerly of J.P. Morgan Chase, and at the time the CEO of a new blockchain-related startup, declared that the blockchain would solve the problem of settlement latency. That is, the amount of time it takes assets like equities changing hands to clear. This is admittedly an obscure area, um, an area that has to do with the infrastructures of post-trade processing. Um, but the benefits are faster settlement times, which means the ability to make money on otherwise latent assets awaiting clearance, um, as well as resiliency and, more importantly, resistance to cyber attack that blockchain-based systems display due to their distributed nature. Um, she and others at this conference, formally and informally in the corridors, expressed the view that these sorts of systems um, could speed up trading, reduce settlement latency, and also um, reduce back office operations costs. Quote, you can fire your IT department, unquote, said one to me um, informally. Um, Masters herself put it more diplomatically. She said, you will, have no more you will have no more reconciliation costs. And then she said, you have to live in the world of financial services to understand the profound implications of that statement, unquote. Of course, you can't fire your IT department because you need to set up and maintain a system like this, and these are systems are, are difficult um, systems to develop. Um, but again, this sort of distributed ledger technology is offering um, basically a kind of promise of automaticity without labor that earlier technologies like, like um, the assembly line and the computer itself offered, a reduction of labor through automaticity. As a ledger, though, the blockchain promises still more. Um, and this is where it gets interesting for thinking about property. Um, it offers the potential to be able to account for everything, since anything can be entered into it, not just Bitcoin transactions. In a seminar at the UC Irvine School of Law in 2013, I was outlining the basics of the blockchain, much as I've done here, when a law professor with expertise in housing finance had, a, had an epiphany. And he said, if mortgage notes had been entered into something like a blockchain, uh, the mortgage settlement mess after the financial crisis of 2008 would not have happened. After all, one of the main problems in addressing the crisis was determining ownership of mortgage paper. Mutual distrust, operational inefficiencies, and outright malfeasance among lenders prevented information sharing. Um, and, and as people said, no one knew who was holding the note, right? No one knew who was holding the mortgage paper to then um, figure out what to do after the, the mortgage crisis and in the mortgage settlement. Um, two years later from that conversation at this American Banker Conference, um, said one participant exactly the same thing, quote, I can't help but wonder if things would have played out differently with the financial crisis if things like liens were in the blockchain. So a funny thing is happening here on, on the way to what people are calling the distributed ledger space. Um, as some are, are referring to this area of potential business opportunity. While leaving aside Bitcoin the currency, people are discovering that ledgers are really good for managing and manipulating other things of value. In rediscovering accounts, they're potentially rediscovering money of account. And some are getting there by some very zealousarian processes of sequestering in, and earmarking. This, in turn, has implications for how they imagine and enact property claims. And that's a whole huge mess of stuff that I just said. What I want to do in what follows is take up three recent experiments um, using blockchain technology to illustrate what I'm talking about here. So um, the first one is the Bitcoin ring. Um, quote, don't store your value in a rock, store it in a block, unquote. So reads the, the website of the Bitcoin ring, and it's btcring.com. The brainchild of Sebastian Neumeyer, an MIT engineering PhD, it offers the ability to create a Bitcoin-based novelty item, a ring, like those, those are mine, linked to a Bitcoin address. The Bitcoin ring provides, the, 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 basically what Sebastian has done is he's provided the code necessary to design a three-dimensional ring that points to a Bitcoin address. I can create a Bitcoin address specifically for the purpose of making this ring. I then use the code that, that Seb has provided to create a file that I can send to a 3D printer 
the printed ring cr uh, contains a QR code, which you can kind of see. You can kind of see it on there, a little 3D QR code that I can scan with my phone um, that will tell me how much Bitcoin is stored in that address. Okay? Um, and it's, you know, for your loved one. So <coughs> while tongue in cheek or maybe not, the Bitcoin Ring project neatly encapsulates a number of assumptions. Love can be expressed in monetary value. The wedding ring is a special kind of sequestered value, right? Zelizer. Um, yet, as the website and several accompanying online videos demonstrate, hilariously, and you should watch them, actual diamond rings can be lost. If lost, their value is lost too. Um, also, a ring might look pretty but could be fake. Again, this is illustrated in the videos that Sebastian has made. Or further, the diamond might have been the product of exploitative practices in a conflict zone. As one woman actor says in one of the Bitcoin Rings videos, as she hurls the ring back at her hapless suitor, I don't want blood on my hands. Um, so now, the thing with this is this basically points to the, the kind of public record, the public database, so you can see how much Bitcoin is there. But who's got the password? How do you deal with the, the private key that you hold you know, in your wallet on a piece of paper to access that value? Well, as with all matters of the heart, this can be negotiated. One of Sebastian's recommendations is that you split the private key between the two partners so that the value that's, that's sequestered in the blockchain can't be spent without the consent and participation of each. Um, and here's where this gets really interesting, you know, very quickly. He says, the Bitcoin ring provides a means of restricting fungibility, his words. Um, and he reflected in an interview with me on an extreme way you could restrict fungibility. Instead of splitting the private key, and, and he means really taking the password on a piece of paper and ripping it in half, right? And one partner gets one part, the other partner gets the other part. Instead of doing that, he said, you could just burn it. Send the, send the Bitcoin to a burn address, which means an address that nobody has the private key to. And he said, it's like throwing money in the fire. But you have this thing that represents this value that's a lot of value, but that nobody can access. Now, Zelizer has taught us not automatically to recoil from the apparent monetization of persons and relations that always seem to attend capitalism and things like this, um, but instead to inquire into their, the social and cultural bases of economic action. Um, some online commentary on this project is critical of the idea that you can put a price on love. Others say that only an isolated geek with little understanding of actual human relationships would find this appealing. But what's most interesting about this to me is the way that it's relying on the blockchain to sequester earmarked value and the use of the blockchain to create a permanent record of a relationship. And Neumeier is explicit on this point. Um, he says, blockchain systems have the ability to show proof of existence. Right? It's all about showing proof of existence of this value without having to rely on a third party to do it for you. Right? There's no notary. Um, there's no Wells Fargo ledger book. Um, and it allows you to show proof of existence without a third party to warrant it, while also restricting the fungibility of otherwise convertible value. It creates a special money, um, basically. And specific techniques, like burning the address, can ensure its perpetual um, sequestration. Um, the, the, the Bitcoin Ring site, um, Sebastian Neumeier, also explicitly reminds visitors to its website of the political economy of actual wedding rings. Um, and this is you know, a rather prominent political statement on, in the stuff that, that he is doing. And on the website, he writes, support, Bitco support Bitcoin mining, not diamond mining. Um, absent a verifiable and unalterable tracking and certification system from the mine to the jewelry store, there's no way to guarantee that a diamond um, was ethically produced and distributed. Um, so while at some level, a kind of novelty toy, kind of a joke, um, the Bitcoin ring um, occupies that same family of phenomena as tin can budgeting, um, but also pointing toward the fundamental political value of accounting and of accounting for value. Um, and Neumeier said that himself that he sees this as a form of social commentary, raising awareness of, uh, raising awareness of the monetary basis of many personal relationships, as well as conflict diamonds. Now, my second example actually has to do exactly with conflict diamonds. Um, 
a very early stage startup, Everledger, is trying to do something about conflict diamonds. Uh, it's a London-based company that uses the Bitcoin blockchain to identify and track diamonds. The idea behind the company is to gather data on diamonds from insurance companies, law enforcement, and diamond producers to create a digital fingerprint for each diamond, for every diamond in the world, and store it in the blockchain. This eliminates the problem of conflicting means and standards of diamond documentation and certification, in theory. Um, you could have a digital fingerprint with enough data in it to identify a diamond and, and um, the record of it in the blockchain can identify its changes in ownership. Um, the founder, Leanne Kemp, whose background includes both the insurance industry and the jewelry business, imagines expanding beyond diamonds to other high-value items. Um, and this is from a, a, a report about this project. Quote, it's starting with diamonds, with a view to expanding into all sorts of luxury goods, high-end watches, designer handbags, fine art. So basically high-value items whose provenance might otherwise be reliant on paper certificates and receipts that can easily be lost or tampered with. Um, here, the blockchain could be used to demonstrate the proof of existence, as Neumeier might say, of a relatively non-fungible object of wealth and thereby provide a chain of proof of ownership or of provenance. For Everledger, uh, the, the business is really all about the insurance industry, um, but it also wants to take on trading fraud um, and conflict diamonds. It wants to do so by using the blockchain to record not just proof of existence of a diamond, but a host of data on the individual diamond itself with enough detail to be able to identify a diamond of suspicious origin that might come on the market. Um, and and uh, Kemp says, if you have a five carat diamond, not only do we capture the serial number that's inscribed on the stone, but most diamonds can be described with four C's, the cut, the clarity, and so on. We've taken not only those four C's, we take 40 other metadata points that make up the diamond, all the angles and the cuts and the pavilions and, and all of the crown. We take all of that, as well as the serial number and the four C's, and we put all of it in the blockchain. So, say a large diamond is stolen and cut into smaller gems. If all of that data had been recorded in the blockchain, Everledger would permit identification of those smaller gems and their association with the original item. So if, if Neumeier's Bitcoin ring restricts fungibility of otherwise convertible value, creating the equivalent of a precious stone, Everledger provides the way to account for non-fungible things, or better, a way to enforce their non-fungibility, to be able to specify forever this diamond as distinct from that one. Okay, so that's Everledger. The last thing that I'll talk about as, before I come to a conclusion is Imogen Heap. Um, and I didn't write any of this out because I think that it's easier for me just to try to explain it. Maybe I won't be able to do so, though. And Imogen Heap was the one singing Tiny Little Human um, when you entered the room. Imogen Heap um, has, is working with some developers on a, a, a concept called Ujo Music. And you've got um, the, a little blurb off the website here. Um, essentially, what she's trying to do is come up with a blockchain-based way for the people who make uh, creative content of whatever kind um, to be able to set up a system of what people that I interview are calling sharing with rights. Okay? Sharing with rights. Um, recognizing that digital content is easily copied and also recognizing that a lot of contemporary creative activity involves stealing people's stuff, right, and remixing it and cutting things and pasting them together and putting new productions out there. Heap is trying to create a system with her, her programmer pals here um, that will allow for, in this case, the creators of music um, to put music out there in the world with this is where it gets really weird, okay? But put music in the world with every little component of that music tied to whoever created it in such a way that when the thing gets shared, the rights that those individual producers, those individual creators have associated with their piece of the production can somehow be recognized, either just with recognition or with a micropayment. Okay? Now, every little piece of the music, like what does this mean? Oh, so, so, well, first of all, it's not just every little piece of the music, it's every person. So here are the people, I don't know if you can really see this. Yeah, you can see it. Here are the people 
who were involved in making that song that you just heard. There's David Horwich, Simon, Simon Minchel. Um, Florence Scout Heap Labor is, um, it says percussion, that's actually her new baby, who I guess is rattling a rattle, like in the, a baby rattle. Um, Simon Hayworth, the mastering engineer, and that's pretty much it, and then her, herself. So there's the network of people. Each one of them had a specific role in making this thing. Um, what she has done, and here's, here's the other artists involved in the making of this um, piece of music, They've worked out uh, what they're calling a payment split. Who gets what percent of the payout based on their contribution of, of, of what? Creative labor to, this, to the making of the song. This is all spelled out in advance. So she's always gonna get 91.25%, but violin one is gonna get 1.25%, violin two is gonna get 1.25%, and so on and so on. Um, what you can do is go online and you can purchase for your use and for your remixing all those little bits, right? You can purchase all the vocals or the bass. You can actually go in and take only pieces of it if you want to. Um, with, uh, you can download the whole thing for 45 bucks for non-commercial use or 1500 for um, commercial use, granted 50% of the rights in the newly created recording, blah, 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 right? Um, and he, so that, that's how this works. And this is all done in a blockchain, okay? So the blockchain is being used to identify ownership of creative content that goes into, that, get, that has been mixed into the making of this song and then is used for anybody who wants to, you could do it, to buy whatever piece you want. I just want to have that little riff of that violin that, you know, at time, like two minutes and 10 seconds for the three seconds. You can buy it and then whoever that person is gets a micropayment proportionate to their share as previously defined here, um, there. Right? Again, sharing with rights. Um, here, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not based on the Bitcoin blockchain, it's based on another one, but um, the, the Ethereum blockchain, if anybody cares. Um, I can t I'll tell you why in a second. But here you can see the public record of all of the transactions. So we can see the, on the, where it says payee ID, that's the public address, the sort of username of someone who has gone in and downloaded um, uh, the whole song. So here, right here, you base. Oh, I can't scroll down because I took a screenshot. Sorry. Um, you can, you, if you go, you'll see it's mostly download, 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 and somebody bought like one of the stems and download, download, download. Somebody bought one of the stems. Um, the idea here is that what this would allow you to do is to take any kind of digital object, right? Allow you to put it out there. Um, not in the public domain at all, right? But put it out there into some new kind of domain of sharing um, that then allows little transactions to ripple out um, through the chain of people and entities that created this piece of digital content as bits and pieces of it are being used by other people in their own creative activity. Um, so, to me, um, what's compelling about this stuff is the way that the blockchain provides a kind of alternative account, um, quite literally, in the form of this distributed ledger. Um, and what's interesting to me, too, is that it provides this alternative account by constraining fungibility. Um, what's going on here is everything in the blockchain is always being linked to its prior history, and if you take the image in heap example, to its prior chain of ownership. You could go back through this database and track at least the public address of who's taking what bit of the song, how whoever is getting paid for it, and on and on and on through the whole chain. All of that history is always there, um, and each contains the history of all of its transactions along the way. What's interesting to me, thinking back to Zelizer, is you're constraining fungibility and allowing fungibility at the same time, right? You're, you're, um, everything is always already earmarked. Everything always already is bound with its prior property claim. But this system then lets you also trade it. So again, as, as my informants put it, talking about this experiment, you get sharing with rights. Um, unlike tin can accounting, however, um, it's pretty hard to cheat. <laughs> um, and again, there can be all sorts of fraud outside of it, but once you're in this world, um, it's hard to cheat. 
Um, hence, Everledger using the blockchain to create provenance for diamonds to prevent their illicit trade or the concealment of their origins, or Bitcoin rings used to record and solidify a relationship with a split private key or a burn. Um, now, think, think back to the kind of money land, which is where I, where I come from. Uh, monetary theorist Jeff Ing Ingham could argue in 2001 that the ability of money to be laundered proved his case that the social meanings of money that Zelizer talked about were secondary, basically, to the state animating the money of account. And he wrote, the state does not inquire into the meaning of money or differentiate between dirty or clean money in the payment of taxes. Um, with this kind of system, whether it's dirty or clean is always embedded in its record of transactions um, forever. Uh, anything placed here is there um, for as long as the participating nodes keep up the system. One of my um, colleagues and informants says, everything, ev the records will all be there until people get bored, right? Until people who are maintaining the system or computers that are maintaining the system decide, eh, th that was fun, we're done now. And then one by one, you know, the nodes go dark until you have nobody doing transaction verification anymore. But as long as you have people doing it, um, you have entries in a ledger um, that can never be separated from their history. You have ongoing records of ownership. Um, you have pasts that endure um, into the future. Um, it may not be surprising to you to know that there's a company seeking to use a system very similar to what Heap has developed um, for land registration in Honduras. Um, and then if you just want to play that out in your mind of where that goes, it goes exactly to where you think it might go, right? Toward people getting title and what happens when you get title? Well, then some other person comes along and says, hey, I'll buy your title and pretty soon you don't have any land anymore. Um, but Heap, I think, is doing something pretty interesting. She's taking these qualities of the blockchain to create a new kind of market. Um, my productions in this market are never really alienated, even when they're incorporated into someone else's. Um, my property and my claim endures. Um, I continue to be recognized or compensated. I retain ownership of my little piece of Imogen Heap's song, um, even if I share it. And, um, and the history of property claims is there um, for all to see. Now, there, there's some contradictions here that are really, really interesting to think about, and we can talk about uh, maybe some more, but it's sort of, I think that these kinds of systems are opening up um, the universe of non-fungible things, paradoxically allowing them to become more easily liquidated by making them more permanent, more indissoluble. By having them keep their history with them forever, having this record be public, um, then also allows them to be traded without that chain of prior ownership um, being lost. And this is Blythe Master's point about the potential of this technology to reduce settlement latency. If we have a better way and a faster way to track ownership of equities or mortgage paper or diamonds or whatever, we can trade more quickly and easily and the reduce, reduce the amount of time a non-fungible asset just sits idle. That's not my phrase. Um, we always have proof of existence. We don't have to chase a paper trail that may have been intentionally obfuscated. Um, uh, we, it's very difficult to alter um, these records. In a way, these kinds of systems carry forward tin can accounting um, because they allow special monies um, and special properties um, and the moral and social boundaries around different items of worth. Imogen's heap, Imogen Heap's experiment may be food for thought at this conference insofar as sharing with rights is a very curious animal to lay alongside private property, commoning, access, and the kind of non-exclusionary rights a like McPherson or Nicholas Blomley yesterday that allow human capacities um, to flourish. And she and her team are certainly imagining that this provides for a way to creativity um, in the digital age to flourish. Thanks. <laughs>